This is PowerPoint presentation and lecture 2.4 on the 1920s. Some of this uh, I covered in the preceding slide, so this is by way of review. I foreshadowed it at the very least in the preceding slides, uh, which is to say 2.3 on World War I. Uh, first, we take a look at the economic foundations. And again, this is to reiterate some points made previously in previ previous uh, presentations. Okay. So in the First World War, the United States cranked up production. In order to crank up production, industry and agriculture both massively expanded their productive capacity. They did this through financing and loans. Well, as a result of this, after the war, uh, for the first couple of years, 19 and 20, uh, the productivity continued as Europe rebuilt itself, but afterwards there was a general drop in demand both for American industrial products and for American agricultural products. Uh, this led to uh, an economic downturn, okay, a recession. In order to countermand this recession, uh, the United States pursued a relatively loose, and this was under the Federal Reserve System, a relatively loose monetary policy. Uh, what we want to remember, and what I'll get to in just a second, is that as a result of a number of factors, uh, most notably the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, but also the continuing competition and animosity between Henry Cabot Lodge and Woodrow Wilson, and as a result of the failure of Wilson's foreign policies in terms of the League of Nations and the 14 points, Wilson becomes discredited, progressivism gets associated with communism and socialism, and so the conservatives politically sweep in. Well, the conservatives, remember, are committed to a laissez-faire economic policy and are also committed to a loose monetary policy uh, in terms of lending. The problem, of course, is how to prevent from happening an economic recession which would be predicted given the lack of demand for American products and given the over-leveraged nature of agriculture and industry. They both over-borrowed. They were deep in debt. Agriculture and industry were both deep in debt. They absolutely needed, they had to, maintain their levels of output in order to be able to finance this massive debt they had incurred in World War I. Well, the plan is simple. Lend out money. What we're going to have in the 1920s that we do not have before, what we had in Epoch I at the end of the 19th century, was we had considerable commercial borrowing. What I mean by that is we had industry, producers, agriculture, farmers, borrowing money uh, associated with productivity, okay? So this was more what I guess I would call supply-side borrowing to expand supply. Now we're going to have a different animal altogether, okay? And it's one that's going to stay with the United States for the next hundred years, all the way to present day. Instead, what we're going to have now is consumer borrowing, okay? Instead of it being borrowing to finance increases in supply, we're now going to have borrowing to finance increases in demand. This will foreshadow the advent of Keynesian economics. Now, this is before John Maynard Keynes writes. Okay? And so what we're going to have is the creation of credit, installments, layaway, all for the consumers. Okay? And it's actually kind of, well, we'll get to that in a minute, but, but uh, this kind of foreshadows something that Marx talked about uh, back in the 1840s. Now, all of this borrowing, all of this credit, okay, creates an economic bubble, very similar to the one that was created in the 1990s up until 2008. Everybody, now, now remember, I want to reiterate this point, I'll reiterate it again and again. In the 19th century, up to this point, up to 1920, we are dealing with commercial borrowing. Borrowing to finance increases in supply. Okay? Now we're dealing with finance, borrowing to finance increases in demand. 
Okay? Well, all of that's well and good. But eventually, I mentioned this once before in one of the preceding lectures. One of the basic economic principles that we want you to walk out of Robert Morris with is the idea that ultimately, the piper has to be paid. You can borrow. You can borrow from Peter to pay back Paul. You can continue to borrow. But eventually, you find yourself in a position where you've borrowed so much money that you can no longer finance it. Okay? Eventually, that money has to be paid back. This is the problem that they're setting themselves up for. Okay? So, in reality, the economic boom, and you see, the 1920s growth rate, ultimately, all things considered, was greater than 40%, okay, as a decade. That's 4% a year, give or take. That was financed at the expense of going into debt, okay? Well, and this is this, the, the basic principle I want you to walk away with and I want you to understand. That you can do that. Nothing wrong with that. That doesn't even make a crisis. You can borrow that money, okay? But ultimately, in order to pay that money back, at some time in the future, you are going to have to stop spending so that you can develop a surplus with which you can pay back that borrowed money. And so you can keep that going for a period of time, okay? But eventually the piper has to be paid. And when he has to be paid, you've got to stop spending. Which means that the 1920s growth that we see foreshadows and rather dooms the 1930s to a period of recession. And so when, when we deal with it that way, we, we really cannot hold completely responsible for the Depression. Uh, Herbert Hoover or Harding, or Coolidge, or any of them. It was a collection of all of the 1920s. By the same token, if we now jump up to date, to the current time, the same thing happened in the 90s. In the 1990s, Alan Greenspan and the Federal Reserve pursued a loose monetary policy. Everybody borrowed money. Everyone went into hot. Everyone bought houses that they could ill afford, but they were able to finance them. Well, eventually they reached the point where they borrowed so much money that they couldn't finance it anymore, they couldn't pay the banks back, and you had this bubble explode in 2008. The same thing's going to happen here. The bubble is going to begin to burst in 1929 with the stock market crash. It's going to conclude its burst in 1933. Uh, down there at the bottom, you see, we also have, during the 1920s, uh, a, a rather manifest improvement in technology. You're going to have the automobile industry grow. The aviation industry, people are now going to be able to fly in planes rather than trains and things. Uh, and the other thing that's going to come up is appliances, okay, which is going to make life itself a lot more convenient. These are the things that consumers are going to purchase, particularly the appliances, uh, that's going to drive them into debt. Now, Let's just review, and I say ref to Lecture 7, Epoch 1, uh, which is to say that was the one on the monetary conditions. Remember the lesson that we walk away with from that presentation. The, remember that we had the image of the bank uh, like a tank of water. Okay? You open up the drain, you open up the valve, and release that water into the system in the form of loan. All is well and good, so long as you are replenishing your supply of money, or water, in case of the analogy, of water at the same rate that you're uh, dispensing it in the form of loans. Okay? And I don't know how many of you tried the experiment. It's really freaking difficult to do. The experiment where you fill up your bathtub or something and then open up the drain just enough to maintain a steady level. It's very difficult to do. It's difficult for the banks to do, too. Uh, and they've got professionals with PhDs in economics doing it. Um, so, uh, all right. And uh, th this is what I mentioned earlier, is that the growth of the 1920s is largely financed by borrowed money. In addition, in the 1920s, the other thing we're going to see, not surprisingly, remember it was 
that last conservative era of the late 19th century, prior to the early 1890s, uh, there was all these massive conglomerations forming, uh, and actually all the way into Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, well, we're going to see the same thing. Um, the big three automakers in the United States, Ford, Chrysler, and GM, are going to end up controlling 85% of the industry, making them an extraordinarily consolidated oligarchy. Okay, by 1929, you see the 200 largest corporations control 50% of the non-banking wealth, and 1% of the banks hold 50% of non-physical capital resources, meaning money, non-physical capital resources is money. Okay, uh, <laughs> so you have a few enormously large banks and a few enormously large producers. So you have this consolidation. What do we see from that? Well, we'll see things like price fixing, which artificially raises the price. Uh, and most importantly, what's going to be created in this era in the 1920s is you may have heard this term in 2008, 2009. You might hear it, hear it now in your, in, in, if you take any economics or pay attention to this at all, that there's this, this idea of too big to fail. Well, this is what's meant by too big to fail. When you have 1% of the banks in charge of 50% of the money, they can't be allowed to go under. Because if they go under, it's a giant suck hole in the liquidity of the country. Okay? It will squash all growth. There will no, be no money out there. Okay? This is the era where we're going to begin this. Prior to this, you didn't have that. You had, in fact, instead, exactly the opposite. You had too many banks, and these too many banks were lending out too much money, and the national government lost control over the supply of money. We talked about this when we discussed the economic catastrophe of the 1890s. Well, now you have a different situation altogether. Now you have too few banks, okay, which makes each of them vital. And if one of them goes under, it's a giant liquidity suck hole in the economy. Labor is going to take it, not surprisingly, we, we, we foreshadowed this in the previous presentation, labor is going to take the face punch in the 1920s. Okay? You have conservatives in the White House, you have an economic downturn, conservatives who have a generally ill-disposed view of the labor unions. You have uh, an economic downturn following, following the, the post-war recession. You have the association of labor unions with socialism, progressivism, and by way of extension, communism. Even though, somewhat tangentially, and we won't get into it, uh, Marx despised the idea of a labor union. Uh, it was entirely in Marx's view counterproductive to have a labor union, but at any rate. Um, okay, and you see, I mentioned this last time, this demand for labor less than supply of labor. That's one of those things you want to keep in the back of your mind. So wages will drop throughout the 1920s. <clears throat> now, while we have growth in the industrial sector, in the manufacturing sector, the growth in the appliance market, the aviation market, the automobile market, we do have some markets that are taking it on the nose, that are, that are declining. Coal mining being principal among them. Why is coal mining going down? Because in 1889... They discover oil in Pennsylvania, in Oil City. That was the first discovery of oil in the United States. They've since developed the ability to refine it into gasoline and natural gas. And so, coal mining suffers a downturn because of two things. There are two factors that are going to contribute to the decline in the coal mine. One, you have another power source, namely gasoline, namely petroleum products. And two, remember... We have an economic downturn in a lot of areas as a result of the post-war recession. The textile industry will suffer a, a, a decline, as will the garment industry. Uh, agriculture uh, will suffer the worst of all. Okay, By 1929, agriculture will be less than 8% of the GDP, uh, which is the lowest point in history for agriculture. Uh, they expanded their productive capacity during the war to meet demand during World War I. Now they're left with all this capacity to produce, uh, but no demand for their product. Uh, as a result of this, there's going to be farm surpluses throughout the 1920s. 
And as we know, what happens with a surplus when supply exceeds demand, uh, price drops. Uh, and this will set up the, the economic decline that really begins in the late 20s and hits its full force from 29 to 33. We also see in the 1920s the development of suburbia. I think a great many of us grew up in suburbia. This is when suburbia begins. Why does suburbia begin? Suburbia begins because of technological advance. Okay, used to be that population centers uh, materialized around industrial productive facilities, factories. Okay, people, as I said in that one, one lecture when we referenced urbanization, people don't so much flock to cities. They flock to jobs. They flock to where industry is. Well, industry was in the cities and so people went into the cities. Well now you don't need to do that anymore. Why? Because you have automobiles. Okay, we're going to create in the 1920s the idea of the daily commute. Commuter traffic. Traffic jams will suddenly start to appear in the 1920s. Prior to that they don't. Okay, so more of your labor force and industry is going to start locating itself in sub- urban areas and driving into work okay <clears throat> and that's the, the the main growth takes place in the automobile industry and its subsidiaries now we know that steel and iron are obvious complements to steel complementary good being a good that's used in another good two goods that are related okay steel and iron are used in the production of automobiles so that's obvious you increase the demand for automobiles, you're going to increase the demand for steel and iron. But there are also additional things that are going to be increased. Increased demand for petroleum products. Increased demand for cement to pave roads. Increased demand for services such as uh, restaurants. Okay? Hotels. You're going to have a massive expansion in hotels, diners, everything. That's where your real growth in the 20s is going to be coming from. Uh... They will pass the Federal Highway Act in 1921 that calls for federal financing of the development of a highway system. Now, this will be the development. A lot of people don't know this, and I guess we'll talk about it in the 50s a little bit. I haven't really prepared that far ahead. Uh, I don't know what the hell I'm going to be talking about in APOC 3. But I'm sure it'll be good, though. But right now, if you're familiar, probably you've driven on them, the distinction between there's U.S. routes, state routes, and interstates. Well, the interstate highway system was going to be developed by Dwight David Eisenhower in the 1950s. What the Federal Highway Act institutes is national highways. Okay? So, like around us, like around where Robert Morris is, uh, one that's not too far away is uh, U.S. Highway 22. Okay? That's built during this era. That's built in the 20s and 30s. Okay? Uh, all the U.S. highway systems will be built. The interstates will be developed kind of based on the U.S. highway system, and in many cases, they'll, they'll replace the U.S. highway system. So, for example, Interstate 70, which spans the country, okay, uh, replaces U.S. Highway 40. Um, it replaces, actually, U.S. Highway 40 and U.S. Highway 50. Uh, U.S. Highway 1 is replaced by Interstate 95, which spans down the East Coast, all the way down to the tip of Florida. Okay, U.S. Highway 1 actually goes down through the Keys. U.S. Highway 1 goes into Canada, spans that coast. Uh, okay. Um, ah, the famous thing in the 1920s is the development of Prohibition. The Volstead Act and the 18th Amendment are passed in 1919. That prohibits the production, sale, and consumption of alcohol. And as a result of this, now the Volstead Act itself will never be fully implemented because it, it's a it, it's a little bit hard to get at. But it wasn't a terribly uh, popular law, so a lot of times it was ignored. Uh, and of course, what we have, it will ultimately be repealed in 1933. It will be the only by the 21st Amendment. It will be the only amendment in U.S. history ever to be repealed by another amendment. Uh, slavery wasn't an amendment. It wasn't repealed. It was just prohibited. Um, the 21st Amendment repeals a previous amendment. 
And of course, what, what's famous and what will rise up in the 1920s as a result of uh, the Volstead Act is bootleggers. And this will be the, the heyday of organized crime. Most organized crime, most of the main crime families of New York come to the United States in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, this is when they're going to make all their money, okay, and become extraordinarily powerful. Uh, so we have, like, so for example, if you if you really if you want to watch, you know, I'm always referencing movies, right? Uh, it's a, the video age, I suppose. I suppose I grew up watching TV and movies, right? But if you really want to want a nice introduction to this era, uh, HBO uh, had a series for the last five years. They just canceled it. My wife and I were both beside ourselves. We loved it so much. It starred Steve Buscemi uh, as Nucky Thompson. Uh, but it was called Boardwalk Empire. I don't know if you've seen it. If you haven't seen it, uh, get HBO, do it on demand something, because it's really worth it. Uh, but it gives an idea of this. This was the rise of the organized crime families. This is when the five main families of New York were formed. Okay? Uh, so you have some of your more famous, uh, ominous figures from history of Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Enoch Johnson, who actually is the character played by, that becomes Mackie Thompson, that's played by Steve Buscemi in, in the show. You have the rise of the Bonanos, the Genovese. You have, uh, the big one is, and, and it's just a little bit after this year, in the early 1930s, you have two main New York bosses, Maranzalo and Masala. Uh, and they go to war with each other. Uh, and actually, Luciano bumps off both of them and will form the very famous Crime Commission. Um, you all also have uh, Albert Anastasia, who worked with Charlie Lucky Luciano and founded the organization that you might have heard of, known as Murder Incorporated. Okay, he was their muscle. Okay, uh, he actually uh, 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 Anastasia got gunned down in a barber shop in New York. He was having a shave. They put a towel around his face after the shave, and two gunmen came in and just machine gunned him down. He never had a chance. Because uh, he, he, he outlived his usefulness, kind of a, in a Night of the Long Knives. And there's a reference that you'll have to Google, because I'm not going to tell you what it is. Night of the Long Knives, you're going to have to look it up. And all I'll give you as a hint is look into the rise of the National Socialists in Germany. Ah, there. <laughs> okay, now race relations. Uh, we have during this era the Great Migration and the Harlem Renaissance. We're in the 1920s. The blacks who, let's see, this is 1920s, this is 60 years. This is two or three generations after slavery. Blacks still haven't been given any equality in the South. They're tr still treated like second and even third class citizens. Women are, for the most part, treated as second class citizens. So slaves are, uh, or, 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 or the recently freed slaves are, are third class citizens. Uh, and so they leave. And they go up north, and a lot of them settle in Harlem. This is when Harlem becomes a, a, a black-dominated area of New York, is during the 1920s. Uh, and actually, in Boardwalk Empire, there's a really colorful and absolutely detestable and brilliantly played uh, character who is uh, one of the Harlem bigwigs. Uh, Doctor, what was his name in the show? Dr. Narcissa. I can't remember who played him, but he played him brilliantly. And he was a detestable character. Um, <clears throat> cultural developments. This is the jazz era. This is when blues starts up. Robert Johnson will actually be in the early 1930s. But this is the time of Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. Uh, Robert Johnson comes up. Uh, um, 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 uh, Muddy Waters is during this time into the 30s. So it's just an absolute wonderful time. Billie Holiday is during this time. Uh, and we're also going to have, in the 1920s, uh, a revival of the KKK. Remember I said the KKK formed after the Civil War, okay, in 1866. And it was virulent for maybe a decade. But then it kind of faded away. Uh, it will make a massive resurgence, and that's what this movie Birth of a Nation that I mentioned in the last presentation Birth of a Nation will be one of the impetuses to doing that, okay? Uh, and, and you see, they estimate that by the mid-20s, there are 5 million members of the KKK. Of course, it's only an estimate.
Now, consumerism, I mentioned earlier that I was going to make a, a minor reference to Marx. Marx refers to a capitalist system as being characterized by conspicuous consumption. And just to get theoretical for, for a moment in time, for capitalism to work, you have to have not only production, you have to have surplus consumption. People have to consume more than they need. If they only consume enough to subsist on, that does not create enough incentive for industrial growth, for manufacturing growth. For manufacturing growth to have enough traction, you need consumers to buy things that they don't need. You need conspicuous consumption. Okay? That's tough. That's tough for people to afford. As I mentioned earlier in the 1920s, and this links these two things together, consumerism is made available. This is the first real time you're going to have this in American history, this kind of consumerism, okay, where, where consumer products, appliances, okay, the electric light bulb is available to every Tom, Dick, and Harry on the street. The way we're going to make it, this conspicuous consumerism go, the way we're going to fund it, is borrowed money. Okay? We advance people the money. They basically mortgage their lives. Okay? You go to college, that's what you do. You're mortgaging your future when you go to college and take out a loan. <laughs> it's the same idea. You're borrowing money to pay back later. That's what's going to fuel consumerism. We're also going to have, as a result of technological improvements, uh, really for the first time in history, what would constitute mass media. Prior to that, absolutely. As early as the, as the late 18th century, you had the National Gazette and the Gazette of the United States, okay, which represented the Federalists and the Republican Party, uh, uh, respectively. And you had newspapers throughout the 1800s, throughout the 19th century. Now what you're going to have as a result of technological improvements is radio. Okay, and the first radio station in history is founded in Pittsburgh. It's KDKA. A little trivia question, a little trivia answer for you. Every radio station and television station, every station licensed by the Federal Communications uh, Commission, okay, <coughs> uh, that is east of the Mississippi, begins with a W. Every station west of the Mississippi begins with a K with the exception of one, the original radio station, KDKA. It's the only station licensed by the FCC whose call letters begin with a K. Okay. Uh, by 1922, there were over 500 radio stations. And this is going to create the era that's very nostalgic for my parents, your grandparents. Okay, where what, pe what people will do is at night they'll huddle together this is the time that they're going to start to create radio shows. They do that more in the 30s, but they're going to start to create radio shows, okay, the shadow and things like that, and that's going to become entertainment. Uh, it's what Marx would say they're, 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 they're beginning the opiating, uh, opiation? opiating of the people. Uh, now, the other idea that comes with this, and more importantly what comes with this, is for the first time, you have the capacity to disseminate information on a mass level. We're talking reach millions of people in real time, much faster than a newspaper. Okay? <laughs> we also are in the age of intolerance. I've mentioned before the idea of the Red Scare. Okay? People were concerned with this rise of progressivism, and the Socialist Party of Eugene Debs, and the rise of these labor movements, and the policies of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, boom, all of a sudden the Bolshevik Revolution takes place in Russia, and Americans become very concerned that the same thing could happen here. And actually, of the two, in terms of Marxism, the United States would have been much riper ground. Russia hadn't had an industrial revolution, so they had no proletariat class. Such is not the case with the United States. You had a massive disparity of wealth. For things that we've talked about 
uh, pre on previous presentations. You had a massive disparity of wealth. You had these few exceptionally wealthy fat cats with their corporate consolidations. And the mass number of people lived on a hand-to-mouth existence. Boy, that is just a fruitful growth medium for, 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 a, for Bolshevism. Okay? You also have the virulence of the KKK. So you have a general age of intolerance. The Red Scare, an intolerance to any opinions other than our own. The KKK, obviously racial discrimination. The Scopes Monkey Trial. Okay, this is the famous time of the Scopes Monkey Trial, where Scopes, who is a teacher in a, in a southern school district, uh, <clears throat> is put on trial for daring to teach evolution. Okay, he teaches uh, the idea of evolution in the schools, and there's a law in the books that forbids the teaching of evolution. Uh, and the ACLU, this will be the, the first real big trial at the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union is involved in, uh, will go down to defend him. Uh, and they lose the case. He's charged a dollar and let go. Um, because the law itself is relatively unconstitutional. Uh, but again, it's the age of intolerance. Intolerance is, is, is not putting up with... Oh, uh, alternative points of view. Anyway, you know what's funny nowadays? Nowadays, you would you would raise much more of a stir in public schools if you were to teach creationism. Now if you teach creationism, that's when you would have stones thrown at you. And it's funny because in my geography class, I, I, I look at both of them because we talk in the beginning of geography, we talk about the formation of the universe. Okay? Well, there's two alternative explanations for that. The, the main scientific explanation is the Big Bang Theory, but there's another theory, which is that it was created by an intelligent creator. And what I try to explain in my class is that neither of these are logically inconsistent within their own parameters. The only difference between them is that the Big Bang Theory has uh, testability. There's empirical observation. The other one has to be accepted on faith. That doesn't mean that it's irrational. Okay. Now, the National Origins Act of 1924 they'll begin to restrict immigration based on point of origin. There is a movement afoot to do that now. And in fact, at least on a de facto basis, not a de jure basis, not by law, but they actually do that. Okay, people that want to migrate to the United States from Middle Eastern countries, from Arab countries, from countries that are known uh, to be fundamentalist in orientation, are reviewed much more closely than someone who migrates here from Great Britain. Okay? And then you have the Sacco and Vanzetti trial. Uh, two Italian Americans put on trial. Uh, and the reason it's included here in this slide is because the, 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 the subcurrent of it is they were put on trial because they were Italian Catholics. Okay? And that's really, there was very little evidence to convict them of the murder. Uh, for which they, and you can look into that in more detail, but the, the web link goes into a little bit more detail on it. Uh, but there was very little evidence to support the allegation that they committed the crime. We had discussed this a little bit, and this is just by way of uh, reiteration, that you have a return to conservatism, you have a Republican domination of Congress. Uh, importantly, in 1921, they passed the Budget and Accounting Act. Under the U.S. Constitution, only the Congress has the authority to raise revenue and to spend revenue. Okay? Uh, the Budget and Accounting Act is going to slightly modify that. And it's, the day, it's how things work to this day. Okay? The President now creates the budget for spending. Okay? Then he submits that to Congress, usually by March. He submits that to Congress. Congress then debates the issue. Typically, it goes into the, in the House, it goes into the Ways and Means Committee. Committee In the Senate, it goes into the Finance Committee. It goes into the Ways and Means Committee, and this is the stuff of American government more than anything else. If you study American government, if you've taken that class here at Robert Morris or elsewhere. Okay, it goes into the Ways and Means Committee. They debate it, they modify it. It ultimately makes it back onto the onto the House floor where they vote on it. It then goes to the Senate. 
gets modified by the finance committee and then onto the, the Senate floor and then finally bounces back to the president who either signs it or offers modifications. So it can take a very long time. This ultimately, the point is, this ultimately gives the president a lot more control over spending. Okay? Because it's ultimately the president that presents the budget. So whatever budget is adopted is a simple modification of that rather than Congress developing it. Then you have the Teapot Dome scandal because one of the things we talked about in the late 19th century was that, and this was one of the reasons for the rise of progressivism, was it had become kind of common knowledge that corruption was rampant in the government. Okay? Well, with a return to the conservatives of the 1920s, this corruption is going to return. And so you have the Teapot Dome scandal, which literally ran for about three years from 21 to 24. And they actually they actually characterize something very similar to this. It's, it's, based, it's loosely modeled after this uh, in that show, The Boardwalk Empire. Albert Fall, the Secretary of the Interior, accepted bribes for allowing oil companies to lease public lands, which is illegal uh, under the Natural Resource Act, which was passed by Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> now, finally, foreign policy. I, we, we talked and learned and demonstrated emphatically that the late 19th century and all through the 19th century was not a period of American isolationism. The United States in the late 19th century pursued a very aggressive foreign policy. This is the period and the era of American isolationism. The United States was feeling the sting from the First World War it did not go as planned. The, the, the horrors of the war came back home. They didn't come home in the form of news reports because they didn't have, you know, real-time mass media the way we do today. But what came home was people with missing limbs and dead people. Okay? And so the United States was now reluctant to become involved in foreign entanglements again. And so now's the era when the United States starts to isolate itself. You have the Washington Naval Arms Conference in 1921, which limits arms, specifically naval forces, among the U.S., Britain, and Japan. This is to try to reduce the tensions in the Pacific, which are already rising. We mentioned this in a preceding lecture uh, on the development of the U.S. empire, uh, that because of the open-door policy for, towards Asia and because of the combination, I shouldn't say just because of that, but because of the combination of that, and the American push into Asia and into the Pacific simultaneously with the rise of the Japanese Empire, the two of them were on a collision course. The Washington Naval Arms Conference of 21 was, was at least designed hypothetically uh, to, to reduce the tensions in the Pacific. Uh, and it won't work. The, neither side abides by the agreement. Neither of them limit their uh, their armaments. Uh, respect for status quo of territory claims in the Pacific, that too won't ever be respected. Then you have the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928 negotiated through the League of Nations where it's an agreement by 62 nations to outlaw war and resolve their disputes peacefully. This too will be stillborn. By the time they sign the bloody thing, it's already useless. I mean, you'll have the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 32. You'll have uh, Italy's first invasion in 33. Uh, and you'll also have, during this time, the Dawes plan to restructure German reparations. By this point in time, uh, Germany is utterly incapable of the reparations that were demanded of it in the Treaty of Versailles. And as a result of that, now here's the problem, and this kind of just by way of conclusion of this whole thing. Here's the problem. This is now the late 1920s. Germany is unable to make its reparations payments, and as a result of trying to do so, the economy of the Weimar Republic is on the brink of utter collapse. In 1923, the National Socialist Party, the Nazis, launched the Munich Putsch to try to take over the government. They fail. Hitler goes to jail. That's where he writes Mein Kampf. Okay? <laughs> so you have the Nazis, the communists, the socialists, all in the streets in Germany protesting against foreign powers protesting against the Weimar Republic. And at the same time, the Weimar Republic itself has an economy that is teetering on the brink of collapse. If that economy collapses, any of those groups 
can seize power very quickly. And that's particularly dangerous. It's not just the Nazis that are dangerous. It's the communists as well, because that would put the communists in league with the Soviet Union, and before you know it, you'd have over half of the European population under communist control, under control of the Soviet Union. And so in an effort to stabilize the situation, the United States is going to come in and, and launch the Dawes Plan, which restructures German debt and tries to make their reparations burden a little less baneful. <clears throat> that sets us up, I think, quite nicely for the collapse of the U.S. economy beginning in 29, uh, and that will be covered in the next presentation, and that concludes this presentation.